Some of the habits that we've uh, picked up as a married couple to grow in Christ as, as one and then as individuals is we've kind of dedicated some time at night to go ahead and read some, uh, some devotionals that take us through like uh, some scriptures. Our first one like we did was like uh, covering over the basics. I believe it was in uh, Corinthians where it was kind of talking about love is patient, love is kind, and understanding those principles and how they can be applied in marriage, but as well as outside of marriage, like other relationships. Uh, some of the things that you can do to grow is, you know, by reading your word, spending time with God. When we say spending time with God, I mean, some people kind of think of like, okay, I gotta whip out like the nightlight, I gotta open up my Bible and sit there for an hour and just read. I mean, you can spend time with God just by praying just by talking to him. And some people think it, it's, I mean, I know for me growing up, it was more of like, how do I, how do I pray? How do I do this? Like, how do I grow in Christ if I don't even know what I'm doing? You know, and at that point, it's more of what I, what I wish I could have told myself that, that long ago was more of just relying on the Holy Spirit. Because once you are saved and once you once you accept Christ, you receive the Holy Spirit, and that Holy Spirit is for discernment and how to guide you through His Word and through the rest of the uh, teachings and how to describe it, how to apply it. And I think that's another big part is applying uh, the Scriptures because you can read, you can listen, but it, uh, I believe Paul says that, like you know, you look. It's almost like if you're looking at a mirror and then you look away and you forget uh, who you are. So that application allows you to utilize what you've read and applying it to your daily life and also as well as applying it for others. Can I ask you a question? Go ahead. When do you feel the most connected to God? For me, and the way I feel the most connected to God is in my alone time. I never really thought it was a big thing until I started doing it. You know, you always hear people like, oh, you gotta do it in your alone time, you gotta do it in your own time. And I was like, ah, you know, I'm busy. Like, I, I never really wanted to. But it comes back to the surrendering thing. It's a choice, you know. God's not gonna, he's a gentleman. He's not gonna force himself to be like, okay, spend time with me now, you know? And that is honestly where I've received most of the answers of my prayers. Um, some revelation, some of the things that God highlights to me that He wants me to surrender to Him. And I mean, it's, it's the best place. It's just me and God alone. And we've actually had an encounter with both of us, you know, enjoying that alone time together and we can do that. And that's where we had our calling answered, you know, like we, we were praying so much like, God, what do you want us to do? What do you want us to do? And we received our calling, we received answers to our prayers, confirmations of things that were just pouring out, and, and it was awesome. My daughter uh, planted sunflowers and wildflowers recently in like a pot. And um, my wife obviously helped her, right? And so they're planting these seeds. She really wanted to just plant seeds and, and to really help them grow, because at school they did it in the cup, you know, the classic cup one. So she wanted to go bigger, you know, or go home. And so she, she plants these sunflowers and wildflowers, and I kid you not, within like two weeks, it's like if this is the dirt, these plants are like up to here. And so I was like, I don't know what kind of dirt or soil you guys got from Lowe's, but that stuff is great, you know. I wish I could put that in my bank account, that'd be amazing, you know. <laughs> As a joke. <laughs> um, but you're like, how about your maturity, Ryan? You know, no. But the thing is, is what's interesting about disciplines is, is Ava has been disciplined, am I right, to go out there every day and water the plant. Every day and water the plant. And, you know, that's the reality. Some, some things we do, we do naturally every day, like brush our teeth, hopefully, right? <laughs> Put on deodorant, that becomes like a normal habit. Uh, eat, drink water, otherwise you would die, right? But some things you literally do have to apply yourself to. And I just want you to know again that uh, we do have to cooperate with God in our growth. 
And, and what we have to do is we have to, we have to show up, like I said, the first night. If we want our car fixed, we gotta bring it to the mechanic and let him do what he does, right? Because I said, I don't have those skills. If I want God to work on my life, I need to show up and let God work on my life. In Christianity, you may have heard the word spiritual disciplines. Uh, what they refer to is the spiritual growth or the spiritual transformation practices that people do, the disciplines and practices that people do to grow, or at least to cooperate with God to grow. Because the reality is God and the Holy Spirit working in you is growing you, but the spiritual disciplines is you applying yourself to the growth. Okay, that's what's important, that we're submitting ourselves to growing. Now, Richard Foster is famous for this book, Celebration of Discipline. And just so you know, we have more books in the lobby. Uh, so th this, they are running out, but if you wanna buy some books, um, we, we're just giving it to you at the cost of what we got. And then Celebration of Discipline, we added in the shipping to help us cover that. But that is out there today, if you guys wanna get those before you leave tonight. But Richard Foster in his book focuses on a lot of disciplines and here's what he has, the inward disciplines of meditation, not like, not like worldly meditation, but meditating on scripture day and night as scripture say. So in other words, thinking about reflecting, remembering, memorizing scripture, uh, prayer, fasting, and study. And then he goes on to the outward disciplines, uh, simplicity or like contentment being content with the, with the little that we have or being content, and even though we may have a lot, should we practice contentment, right? Instead of having a bunch of stuff in our life. Solitude, submission, service, and serving. And then the corporate disciplines, together we confess our sins to one another, we worship, uh, there's guidance by the pastors and there's celebration. Um, and so Richard's book for me personally was pivotal in college for me. When I, when I left here to go to college, the University of Valley Forge, this was my uh, spiritual disciplines class textbook, and it was uh, life-changing for me. So I just want to recommend that, that read to you. So we know that watering a plant means it's going to grow, right? Especially if we have it in soil and it's in the light, everything's working together to make it happen. And that reminds me of John 15, our scripture from the first night that Jesus is the true vine. And I wanna read that one more time just to help you understand how important it is that we stay connected to God in order to grow, because that's what tonight's gonna to be about. So it says in John 15, one, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in the vine. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So I wanna stop there and say just how vital it is that we constantly come to God. We're constantly staying aware of God's presence in our lives and that we're intentionally seeking his face and hearing from him. And so spiritual disciplines, tonight we're gonna focus on the Bible, spending time in our word. I think that's the most vital one, in my opinion. It's, it's, it's one that is so important. I, I, think, I think they're really all very powerful. I think prayer is right up there too. But I really think that we need to, as a church, discipline ourselves to let God water us through his word. But before I dive into spiritual discipline of the Bible, I think that we need to approach spiritual disciplines like reading the Bible in the proper way. Because sometimes we can go to God and just do it because we're supposed to. And so I wanna counter that with two points. Number one, spiritual disciplines are more of a relationship than a routine. Spiritual disciplines, like going to read your Bible, is more of a relationship than a routine. So, for example, I don't hang out with my friends or family because of routine or out of obligation. Do you? Or maybe, maybe some people you might feel that way, like your boss, right? Because you have to go hang out with them. But like friends and family, 
For me personally, I want to hang out with them. Okay, because I love them and we have a relationship and I value them and they value me. And because of that relationship, I find life. The same goes for God. When it comes to spending quality time with God, I don't feel obligated or like it's a lifeless routine to hang out with him. If we feel like going to God to read the word, to read the Bible or pray or serve is an obligation or a duty, then we may not see God as our heavenly father and friend. We may be looking at him more as some master that we serve, which is definitely a picture in the Bible, but he's more than just our Lord and master. He's our father. He's our friend. Okay. And so we need to look at him in the proper way. He's relational. He's a relational God. Am I right or am I wrong? He's a relational God. I don't do things for my family or friends because of obligation or duty. I do it ultimately out of relationship, love, and to serve them. The same thing goes with God. I serve God and obey him because of my love for him. So if we're not careful, we can make spiritual disciplines like a workout routine and, and put spiritual growth to the side until the next workout time. In other words, what time do you work out? Nine in the morning, eight, seven, six, right? Maybe at night, my dad likes to go at nighttime, nine, nine thirty, right? Maybe even later sometimes if your day is long. So you're in the gym at 1030. So the next time you work on your growth, is it the next night at 1030? Is it? Hopefully not, right? See, what happens is if it's, if it's a duty, if it's a task to read the Bible, that's what we'll do. But if it's a relationship, you're going to be hanging out during the day and all of a sudden God is like drawing you to hang out with him and you're like, you know what? I want to read the Bible right now. And it's three in the afternoon. Or I'm on lunch break and I feel drawn to God because God is calling me to him and he wants to speak to me. So I hang out with him. So this whole thing about like reading the Bible once a day, like what is that? What is that? What if, what if you actually thought beyond that? What if you thought that you could, one, Paul says, pray without ceasing, right? So pray all day. What if we did what the scriptures say, meditate on these commands, these scriptures day and night, which means continuously. Now, it doesn't mean every minute of the day, but it means meditate to think about scripture or to read it. Maybe you've memorized it so it comes to your mind again. Are you guys with me? Because sometimes we do the just the amount that we need to do okay let me hang out with god for 30 minutes how many of you put a timer on hanging out with your friend <laughs> right like no one does that all right we got uh we got 30 minutes man well you might do that because of work but hey, I, hey don't you you don't have anything to do tonight do you uh, no i don't but uh, we got 30 minutes you know no we don't do that you know we, we have a relationship with our friends and our family, so we don't care how, what, yeah, sometimes we gotta get home because the kids, you know, that's, that's our life. But the reality is, is, hey, let's go until I'm done. Until I feel like God and I have had a good time and he's like, hey, I got things to do, I'll see you later, you know. I got the world to save, you do too, get out of here. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not joking though, that's like tomorrow night. Like you hang out with God enough, guess what you're gonna find out? You're supposed to be doing something. I'm kind of like slick sometimes, I guess, when I get serious about things. I don't mean to be. It just comes, kind of comes out. But like, I just realized listening to myself say that, that was a pretty strong comment right there, you know? But the reality is, as we do hang out with God, we will discover that there's much more to this life than just, you know, our work, our movies, even church attendance. Like, this has been a powerful week but I'm not satisfied because God is calling me to the lost. He's, he's pulling me to help the person who has never even worshiped one worship song yet. So that's something to think about for tomorrow night. Do not miss tomorrow night. And as Brandon said, we better be ready to be uncomfortable uh, even tonight, I guess, you know, as God's working. 
So if we're not careful, we can take the relationship out of the journey with God. I'm not reading my Bible to check off a box for God like he's my boss with a to-do list or my wife. I need to finish this before I go watch a movie. Let me go read my Bible, then I can watch a movie. If we are juggling movie time with God time, we've already messed up. We need to consider hanging out with God. If God is part of our agenda, that means he's not part of our everyday life. Like in other words, I don't squeeze God into my agenda, I squeeze everything else into my agenda and God has my whole day. That's life transform, transformation right there if you think about it. God, I give you this day, so if you wanna show up at work today to speak to me or you remind me of a verse I read this morning or last night, I will think about it. Oh, you're telling me to share that with my coworker because he's hurting and depressed, let me go ahead and do that. That means God has my entire day. I'm not gonna all of a sudden plug in when it comes time at 9.30 at night because all the kids are in bed that now I hang out with my father from heaven. No, I'm with him all day. Personally, I long to hunger and fellowship with God all day. Does it mean I get to do it all day? No. But can I stay aware of his presence and what he's doing in my life? Yes, absolutely. Number two, we practice these disciplines because of God's love not for his love. Let that sink in for a moment as I drink this water because I'm super thirsty. I'm not going to hang out with God because I want him to love me. He already does. And this is going back to the first night, but I, every time I talk to people about this subject, for some reason this comes up a lot. Like, I feel bad. I missed Bible time two days in a row. I'm like, what's wrong? Do I have to get saved again, right? Which, I mean, am I in trouble? No, what it is, and pastor says this, I say this, it just means you've missed out. You may have missed out on strength and nourishment and encouragement and truth and life. And so, yeah, you're probably feeling kind of empty, right? Maybe you're feeling discouraged. Well, it's time to hang out with God again. I used to think that spiritual disciplines kept God's love for me filled up. And then as if, as if, I, if I didn't hang out with him, it just kept going down. That wasn't God's love. That was my perception of God going down. Did you catch that? God's love for me didn't change one bit. But my heart for God was changing. My fear of God and what he thought was rising up. You see that? God's love has never changed for you. The thinking that we do these things to be loved and accepted is not grace, but works. And we don't live by, we're not saved by works. Jerry Bridges, I'm using him again. He says this, living by grace means you are free from having to earn God's blessings by your obedience or, or practice of spiritual disciplines. If you have trusted in Christ as your savior, you are loved and accepted by God through the merit of Jesus, and you are blessed by God through the merit of Jesus. Nothing you ever do will cause him to love you any more or any less. Now, do I believe that Jerry here is talking about that uh, there won't be blessings, uh, that if I, if I obey or don't obey, I'll still be blessed? Well, I think God's grace does work like that. I don't think he's referring to that. What I do think, in other scripture references we see is that you will be blessed if you obey because you won't suffer the consequences of disobedience. So yes, does God's grace continue to be for, there for you? And is it a blessing? Absolutely. But should we ignore ever hanging out with God? No, we lose the blessing of what we find when we hang out with God. So there's a little difference there. And then he goes on to say this, too often when we think of Christian growth, we load down the gospel of the grace of God with a lot of oughts. If I'm going to grow, I ought to do this, and I ought to do that, and I ought to be more committed, more disciplined, more obedient. When we think or teach this way, we are in danger of substituting duty and obligation for a loving response to God's grace. God is wanting a relationship. He's not wanting robots. Eli, he, he nailed it there. 
He's, not, he's a gentleman. He's wanting you to freely and willingly come to him out of love. He's not forcing you to come to him. He says, Jerry says this, we should seek to practice commitment, discipline, and obedience. We should be thoroughly committed to submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in every area of our, of our lives, but we should be committed in these areas out of a grateful response to God's grace, not to try to earn God's blessings. In other words, Jesus died on the cross for us as we talked about Monday night. And because of that, we are loved and accepted. So we still come to him with that same approach. He loves and accepts us. That's why we hang out with him. That's why we're disciplined. That's why we obey. Why am I saying this? Because I talk to those who have left the Muslim faith and they feel like they have to work in order for God's favor or love to be upon them. If they miss one of their prayer times, God doesn't love them. This is a real, this is a reality check. This is a real situation when you're helping the people that have left other religions that if I didn't do something, that means God doesn't love me. That's not true. But I always say this, now that you know he does love you, what's stopping you from doing everything for him? What's stopping you from wanting to be with him and enjoy him and lavish in his love for you? So in other words, for God, our motivation for commitment, discipline, and obedience is more important to God than our performance. God sees right through the performance. I mean, here's the thing. If, if, if I go and hang out with God to just do it because I'm supposed to, I'm probably not going to get anything from it because he sees right through that. And he's like, I'm here, but it's like, you're kind of like distract, distracted driving, you know, or, or texting while everyone's hanging out. And you're not really here. You're distracted. You ever been like, you ever been out with someone and I, my wife and I have been guilty of this, more me, but we're on our phones and we're really, we're there, but we're not. We do that sometimes in our personal time with God, don't we? So I have some help for that tonight to help us in that area and we're going to get into it. So let's get into the spiritual discipline because now it helps you understand how we approach disciplines. We approach them out of love, Okay. And uh, we don't do it for love. And the other one, again, was, got to remind myself, relationship, not routine. Please hold on to that. As you're helping people who have gone through religious, uh, legalistic churches or uh, denominational backgrounds, that it's like, if you do these things, then you're okay or if you're dealing with other um, religions like Islam, who if you do these things, then, then God's favor will be upon you and you will get to heaven. When you come in contact with those people, you have to help them understand that we don't do this out of religious obligation. We do this out of relationship. So why am I focusing on this one discipline? First of all, I don't really get to touch biblical history or things about Jesus every day except for this. Like Jesus' words have been preserved on this paper. History of Israelites and God and man are in this book. To me, that's fascinating. The fact that William Tyndale was burned at the stake so that this could be copied and spread throughout his region so people could read the Bible makes me pretty curious what's in it that people have died for this so first of all I, I think it's incredible that we have we get to touch in a sense something that Jesus has influenced directly and we get to encounter him but then I heard a story one time of someone who was watering plants around his house true story and he was watering these plants for like forever and then one day, a landscaper came by and was like, dude, you're watering weeds. <laughs> the 
funny thing is, is I've done that. So, <laughs> my my daughter was watering plants, but this guy was watering weeds, and I was busted doing that myself. And uh, I guess what I want you to know is that we could be watering the wrong things in our lives. You know that we could be giving too much time and effort and energy to lies and to things that are really wrong for us, that are gonna really actually hurt people around us and as well as hurt ourselves. So we're gonna do a little Bible study tonight to help you practice. So we're gonna turn to 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 to help you see how important it is to have the Bible in your life to study, to practice God's word so that you're not watering bad things, you're not giving uh, life to bad things it's a waste. You need to put that away. You need to, the Bible says to put to death the old man and bring to life the new one or to water or to nurture the new nature that you have in Christ through the spirit. So you're a new creation. Let's feed that. Let's water that. So 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 says this, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. So according to these two verses, this is what I would ask myself if I was studying the Bible. What is the value of the Bible in my life or our lives as children of God? As someone who is in the family of God, what's the value? The first thing I'm writing down because I'm studying the Bible, it's I don't know, 7.30 in the morning, I'm drinking coffee. The first thing I notice is it says, all scripture is inspired by God. That tells me it's God's word to me. That sounds super valuable right there, right? That's God speaking to me. How many times do you get to say that God is hanging out with you? Well, as many times you hang out in the Bible. <laughs> The next thing I see is God's word is useful to teach us, right? It's God teaching us. Who had really bad teachers sometimes growing up? And okay, it's hard to admit that in front of teachers right now because my wife's a teacher and I don't want to make teachers feel bad. But you know, sometimes, you know, you know, yeah, okay. Anyway, don't get in trouble. A lot of great teachers out there. I had a teacher won't say much because this is being videotaped, but there was a project, like, there, there was, you know, the old classic projection, uh, what do they call those things? <laughs> Overhead projector. For those of you who just came out of your mama's womb, that is a clear film that has a picture on it and it goes over light and then it's like projected onto a wall. So when I got to college, I didn't expect to see that because that was in 2002, okay? Um, he begins to write one word down and it, five minutes later, another word down underneath that, five minutes later, another word. So I go at the end of class and I say, hey, uh, professor, what are those words? He's like, well, that's your notes. You were supposed to write that and then anything I say afterward, you're supposed to write it in your notes. I was like, oh, that's a, that's a, I've never seen that teaching style before. <laughs> okay. I, I, to be honest with you, my friend, I, I was expecting PowerPoint projection at least through Microsoft Word, but uh, okay. Or Microsoft PowerPoint, okay. So there is sometimes bad teachers, but here's the thing. God created teachers and you get to hang out with God, the teacher, right? Let me just get to the point before I get in trouble. It's God teaching us. Ever thought about going to school and God is your teacher? How cool is that? God's word teaches us what is true. Well, that's kind of good to have in a world where lies run rampant. I love Psalm 119, uh, verse 104. Well, I got lucky and, and flipped right over to it. Psalm 119, 104. Your commandments give me understanding. No wonder I hate every false way of life. Wow. 
Do you know how we know which ways are false or, or wrong? You have to know what's true. How does someone know a genuine $50 bill from a fake? You have to know the genuine $50 bill. When you see the authentic, genuine bill, then you know everything else that's fake and counterfeit. Do we know what's counterfeit in our lives? Can we pick out counterfeit friends, young people, or even us adults? Can we pick out counterfeit commitment that's actually gonna fail us? Why is it, by the way, that we give so much faith and put so much faith in people that will probably not be perfect at staying faithful to us and yet very little to God? You know, sometimes I think about that in my own life, how many times I did that, putting all my trust in the man. The Bible says don't do that. Just trust God more than anyone else. God's word helps us real, realize what is wrong in our lives. It exposes and reveals things so it will be humbling. The Bible really is like a giant light in a room of your heart revealing what shouldn't be there. I remember reading a story about Billy Graham and he was having an interview at his house with his wife and the camera crew came, they were coming and so they're like, we gotta clean the house. So they're cleaning the house and uh, they, they made it really nice but then the camera crew came in and brought in like really bright lights. And when they turned them on, all of a sudden they saw all the cobwebs in the corners of their room and they didn't realize how messy things were. And maybe that's sometimes why we avoid the Bible because we don't wanna see the truth of what's in us. I know that's why the world wants to deny whether it's true or not because they don't wanna be held accountable to it. So reading the Bible is very humbling. It humbles you because God loves you. <laughs> God's word corrects us when we are wrong. It corrects our paths, our ideas, our evil intentions, but it doesn't leave us without the right direction. I'm telling you guys, this is my Bible study. We're, we're going right now through my morning Bible study a few weeks ago. This is what we're doing. God's word teaches us to do what is right. So I love that. I love that God doesn't just say, don't do this, but God says, do this. That's so awesome. And if we're willing to trust and obey God's word, we'll find out it actually works. We'll find out that God's word actually works. God's word prepares and equips us to do every good work. That's the last verse. God's word prepares and equips us to do every good work. God can equip you through his word and the power of his word. We need God's word in order to do the good works that we have. Now, let me ask you a question. I have it in all caps on my paper, but I won't yell. Take the Bible out of your life or out of this civilization, what do you get? Take it out of society, what do you get? Chaos. Chaos. Or what I saw in New York City recently in Times Square. Or what I see in certain people's lives when I'm helping them. Sometimes what I see in Christians' lives. It's weird for me. But as a pastor, sometimes you get sometimes people that seem just like the world because they're just simply lacking the wisdom and guidance of God's word. I'm confident that, and no offense to those who need to see Jody because Jody was spot on last night. Spot on. Because here's the thing, we need the Bible, but we need teachers of the Bible, right? We need counselors of the Bible. We need disciples that know the Bible but I am confident that Jody would have less appointments if we went and hung out with our counselor, the Lord Jesus Christ. Because everything Jody's giving for advice comes from the Bible. <laughs> and I don't mean that as a cut to anyone who seeks mentoring or counseling. I, I handle people as well that also read the Bible. And what do I do? I teach them scripture when we get together. It's funny. 
you want help, get ready to read the Bible with me then. Because <laughs> that's the only place I'm finding my answers for you anyway. And some really gifted, anointed teachers who have written some awesome stuff inspired by the Bible. By the way, where did this Grow Conference come from? The Bible. Wanted to make sure I get that across tonight. This entire Grow Conference was inspired by Scripture. So that means the power of the Bible has the ability to create this and change lives forever. That's awesome. So how does the Bible actually help us grow? We grow when we believe the truth and promises of it. They're not just words, there's truth to it. People were set free last night from bondages of sin and brokenness and emotional damage because they believed the scriptures. It was the scriptures that was the remedy last night. We grow when we obey and apply it to our lives. This is the most important point tonight. We grow when we obey and apply it to our lives. Eli said it in the video. We have to apply it. It's like reading the Bible it, this is, I mean, does anyone go to bed like this just hoping that it all transfers, you know? Does it, does it transfer in? God, please transfer like a download, you know? Remember AOL, by the way, with the phone line? That was crazy. Like, you can't update your heart and mind by laying your head on the Bible or just reading it. We actually have to obey it. We actually have to apply it. And what happens is, the reason why it changes you is, be, is because you form what's called biblical convictions. Because we have beliefs, but then we have biblical convictions. Let me explain that to you real quick. A conviction is something you believe so strongly it affects the way you live. So you have beliefs, but then you have convictions. And when you believe that truth, it affects the way you live and it turns into a conviction. That's why all the disciples died for Jesus except for John because he was imprisoned on the island of Patmos writing the book of Revelation. Okay, but all of them died for the sake of the gospel because they were convinced, they were convicted and their convictions were Jesus is real. He's willing to die. I'm willing to die for him. Someone once said, a belief is what you hold. I'll give you a chance to write this down because I think it's really good. A belief is what you hold, but a conviction is what holds you. So I believe this, but my conviction keeps me in the proper life to live and behave the proper, proper way. Yes, I'll say it one more time. A belief is what, hold, what you hold. Sorry, a belief is what you hold, but a conviction is what holds you. A belief is what you hold, but a conviction is what holds you. You may live contrary to what you believe, but you cannot live contrary to your convictions. So we can believe in God, but not let God's teaching change the way we live. Did you know that? We can believe in God, but not let God's teaching change the way we live. And I love what Jerry Bridges hits us in between the eyes with this. This is what he says. This hit me really hard. One of the banes of present day Christianity is the way we sit every week under the teaching of God's word or even have private devotions or perhaps participate in a Bible study group without a serious intent to obey the truth that we learn. But then he goes on to use the scripture from Ezekiel 33, 31 through 32 that says, my people come to you as they usually do and sit before you to listen to your words, but they do not put them into practice. Indeed, to them, you are nothing more than one who sings love songs with a beautiful voice and plays an instrument well, for they hear your words, but not put them into practice. What happens is our tendency seems to be that we equate knowledge of the truth and even agreement with it as obedience to it. So in other words, I can come into church and I can hear it and I can believe it and I can agree with it. But the most important thing you can do next is what? Do it. There is no power in the word if we don't apply it to our lives. 
It also goes back to what we were talking about last night. You have to believe in the truth of Christ that he has set you free and you are free indeed. And then you actually have to walk out of here free. You have to believe in such a way that it's a conviction that I'm no longer a slave to sin. I'm no longer a slave to my past or my damaged life. I'm no longer defined by what that, that guy said or that girl said or what my parents said. I'm not defined by that. That is now a conviction of mine. My conviction is what God says about me. So whatever people say, I don't even care. I'm convinced that God has the final say. His word, by the way, is his word for us. And how do we apply this? Everyday life should be like a theater in which we learn to apply, to apply the word of God. Everyday life. I mean, we're talking about every event you go through, every activity, every circumstance you face is an occasion of applying scriptural principles or scriptures, straight up just scriptures to your life. In other words, the, the Bible says some scriptures I wish weren't in there. You ever read some of those? Be thankful in all circumstances. Like, really? Do I have to, God? I don't want to. How do we apply that? Well, what we can do is, instead of reading a gazillion chapters of the Bible and say, I'm good, I did my thing, what if we did take that one verse and try to apply it for like three days? You would get more out of that than reading three days worth of scripture. That's what I mean by application of the Bible. If you want to grow, apply what you're learning. Even the fact that we're doing four nights in a row of learning all this stuff is a risk of you getting information overload. It is. I'll be completely transparent with you. You'll have to keep this book and go back and go, let me try to apply lesson one. <laughs> Session one, night one. I'm serious though. Or you can have a daily time with God, read the same scriptures I did and apply it to your life till the day you die. Or Jesus returns and brings us with him in the sky. Thank God for that. Right? So I asked Pastor Kuhn and he'll come up first. I, I thought let's get some practical ways and examples of how uh, pastors here at least have done devotional time with God, reading their Bible and praying. So I'm asking Pastor Kuhn to come on up and share his example, his personal time. Thanks, man. Thanks, Pops. You're welcome. Sons. Grandpa, how come you're always reading the Bible? Well, I'll tell you what, son. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to take this coal bucket down to the river, and I want you to bring me a bucket of water has holes in the bucket but I want you to run back to me the bucket of water so okay grandpa so grandson he walks he runs down to the river and he gets a bucket of water he comes back up he hands it to him and he, grandpa says well where's the water oh, oh, it's gone grandpa well you need to go back to the river and get me some more water okay grandpa but make sure you run faster okay Runs down, grabs a bucket of water, comes up, hands it to him. Grandpa, it's empty. What am I going to do? How can I get you a bucket of water if it's empty? Son, you got to run faster. Okay, Grandpa. Goes down, comes back running real fast, splashing water. Goes to hand to Grandpa, says, Grandpa, it's empty again. I know, son. That's why I read the Bible. It keeps me clean. It keeps me cleansed. Do you see any more coal dust in the bucket? The reason we read the Bible is to get cleaned. The reason we read the Bible is to have a knowledge of God. I was working with a doctor of internal medicine here that came to me for counseling for about six weeks. It was about six weeks into it. And she says to me, she says, she's moved on to Carolina, opened up her own practice of internal medicine. And she says, I have a question for you. How come in six weeks I have gotten more from you in counseling 
than 10 years of me going to my psychiatrist and she drove it every, every month to Philadelphia. For 10 years I've gone to the same psychiatrist. How come I've gotten more in six weeks? I reached down at the table that was in front of us in the office. Can I close this? Huh? And I said, because I used this the last six weeks. She says, well, pastor, it's worked. So I bought her a Bible when she departed as a gift. And I heard from her after that. And she was obviously still serving the Lord. Now, one of the things I do in my Bible reading is that I practice pretending I'm in the Bible days. What a difference it makes. You name a story, any story you want, I guarantee you I will pretend that I'm actually experiencing that story. I pretended before that I was in the lion's den, petting those big lions. When I was reading the story, what did that feel like? I wanted to know what that must have felt like. I pretended two different types of characters when Joseph come riding on his chariot to see his brothers who, who have betrayed him in Genesis early on. I pretended I was a brother to see what it felt like to stand before Joseph. At the same time, I pretended I was Joseph and I couldn't ride fast enough in my chariot to go greet my brothers. And in doing that, I began to have a sense of what it must have felt like in that day. To think that I could either die or I could be accepted by my brother, Joseph. When I have pretended to be the character, when I've pretended, and by the way, I know I may sound a little different, but I even imagine the sounds of the day. I know there are tapes that will do that. But I, remind, but I listen to the sounds. I make up sounds in my mind to what it would be like in, walking in the streets. When Jesus was walking the street, he looked up to Zach. Zach has come down. And the Bible said the, the people were pressing against him. I pretended what it must have been like to be pressed against. I pretended what it must have been like to have all that distraction around him. I pretended what it must have been like when um, he, he heard all those noises. And I imagine what would be the noises? Kids screaming, dogs barking. Really, I do this. And, and then I see Jesus do a miracle the way he did. Reached out to him. Then the man came down and gave his heart to the Lord. Um, I, I, I played a game Saturday. And I, I, I called the game, um, what scripture can I use? What scripture can I apply? It was a game I made up. You ready? Wait till you hear where it came from. You ever, how many of you ever listen to Soundscape, my TV? It's an all music channel. Only my wife and I have our hand. Are you kidding me? Just my wife? This is good music. You got a 10 of four, four, three. You got to turn it on. And it's nothing but just gorgeous music. Well, they have all these quotes. That, now you know what I'm talking about? They have all these quotes. So I played a game Saturday. I, mean, I created a game. The game was this. How many scriptures can I apply to the quote? It didn't matter if it came from Confucius or who it came from. I was amazed at how many scriptures I could apply to the statements that other people around the world have made up that made the TV screen. It was a famous statement. I was able to take, I told my wife, I was able to find a scripture from almost every single one. Listen, for 40 years, I, 48 years, I've studied the Bible. For 48 years, I've also studied up on the the society's sciences, psychiatry, psychology. I'm not any one of those, but I've studied all that stuff because you learn both sides. Do you know that if I could sit down with a psychiatrist, with a psychologist, with a sociologist, if I could sit down with a hypnotic person, if I could sit down with all the sciences, I could show them from the Bible that what you are actually teaching people in your sessions was originated 2,000 years ago in the Bible. The Bible is the best scientific book you'll ever read. So between reading the scripture on a daily basis, journaling what I read, getting nuggets, you know that the messages I preach here at Calvary are from my devotional life. They're from my devotional life. I form messages from my devotions because I do what's called study read. I'm not just a reader, I'm a study reader. I have to study every sentence I read. 
Is there a message in that sentence? Is there a nugget in that verse? Is there a truth in that word in the Bible? And I jot that stuff down. Then I start looking up things and I have a file and I can start dropping in those truths and I can start forming messages. So some of the messages that I bring you have been in the preparation for several months, some for several weeks. And yes, sometimes God gives it to me within the week, what I'm to preach on. But they've been birthed from the needs in the body of Christ, predicated and based upon what I've read in the Bible to deal with those needs in the church. And I think that's why over the years so many people would say, and I'm going to close with this, I, 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 we're limited time. That's why I, I feel like when so many people would come to me and say, Pastor, I mean, many times, I'm not exaggerating, but they say, Pastor, it's like you were in our home this week. I said, well, I wasn't, but the Holy Spirit was. And when the Holy Spirit lays that on our hearts, by the way, through the reading of the word, and you begin to see the word connecting to the need of the body of Christ, then the smart thing to do is to pray about what part, what and how, and you start forming those notes. That's how I do my messages. And then I put all the material together and I begin to preach it. But it was birthed out of my devotional life. So I find the Bible, three things. I find it very calming, because when there was trouble in our family growing up, and there were some rough days. My dad came from prison after 18 years. My sister stopped serving the Lord. We had some stress in our family and other family members. You know what my mom did every single time? Every, say every. Every single time my mother would be found sitting on the floor with her legs crossed in the Bible, reading and praying. I was raised on that visual. I was raised on that visual. That's why I don't listen to the Bible. I read the Bible. Because I feel like I can retain it visually better if I see it with my own eyes. So it's calming, it's nurturing because it teaches me. And thirdly, it's confirming because now I know how to live my life because I find a scripture evidence confirming how I should live. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I have time for one more, so I better just pick pa Pastor Brandon since he hasn't had a chance to do a little speaking. Sorry, Jody. We love you. Love you. This is Brandon, our youth pastor, just in case you don't know who this is. It's our youth pastor. Give him a hand real quick. All right, so Pastor Kuhn, oh, sorry, Pastor Ryan Kuhn asked me to share how has the word of God in my life spoken and taught me like without somebody doing it for me, just reading the word of God and the Holy Spirit began speaking to me through the word and how did that experience change my life. So I wanted to share with you guys, I'm not gonna read the scripture itself, but I was in my personal devotion when I was a student and I was reading the story when Jesus heals the paralytic man and there's four key characters in that scripture. There's the friends carrying the man, there's the paralytic man being carried, there's the crowd and there's Jesus. And ultimately we know that they have to cut a hole in the roof and lower him down to Jesus. And as I'm reading that scripture, just like Pastor Kuhn says he, he likes to find himself in the scripture, I wasn't doing that. The Holy Spirit just lit me up and put me in the scripture. And he says, he said, you are the crowd. You're living your life as the crowd. And I just begin hearing what he's, what the Holy Spirit's telling me and teaching me of what that means. And for me growing up as a student, I didn't have a crazy testimony where I ran away, but I also wasn't always crazy on fire. I was almost scared, so scared of the world that it was gonna influence me that I wasn't making an influence on the world. So the Holy Spirit said, you're the crowd. You're just looking at Jesus. Jesus, I need more Jesus. I have to be in church. I need Jesus that I'm ignoring the people that really needed Jesus behind me. I was in public school and I'm so worried about not being influenced by the world and keeping my eyes strictly on Jesus that I didn't even see the people around me that needed help, that I could have been ministering to people around me in the school, sharing Jesus with them and I missed those opportunities. The Holy Spirit saying, you're being the crowd. You have your back turned on people that need to hear Jesus and you're just worried about keeping your eye on one man. We should be keeping our eyes strictly on Jesus. But if we are truly 
looking at Jesus, we're going to be paying attention to what he's doing, not just, I need church, I need church, I need church, I need Wednesday night, I need, sun, I need Sunday morning, I need Grow Conference. Don't let this conference this week be you just Jesus. I need Jesus Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I need Jesus Sunday morning. And then when you go back to work tomorrow or Monday morning, you miss the people around you that you should be allowing, getting them to Jesus. The crowd should have turned and pushed the paralytic man towards Jesus. But instead they made him go on a roof and cut a hole. So the Holy Spirit told me, you're the crowd. And so it changed my perspective. It changed my mission in life. That's why I'm so excited about tomorrow night what Pastor Ryan's going to share because we can't let this conference just be us getting Jesus nonstop and we don't even, it doesn't change who we are and what we do. We can't turn our back on people. We can't be the crowd when we leave here. So Ryan's going to talk tomorrow about a mission and how we're supposed to go. But that's what just in my life, there, it, wasn't, it wasn't a sermon. It wasn't a Sunday morning. It was just me reading the Bible and my personal devotion time and the Holy Spirit was just like, that's you, lit me up, put me in the worst position. You're the crowd, you need, to, you need to change your life, you need to change your thinking, you need to change how you act and live on mission. Come on up, Jody. I asked Jody to prepare some, I can't leave him hanging like that. I'd be messed up. Grandfather came to a son, Grand Tuntner. <laughs> Just had to do that to you. <laughs> I have always told people that, um, you know, you really have to set time aside. And it usually helps. And, and I, I made it a habit to get up early in the morning and and that's really, you get to the point, how many have gotten to the point where you get up so much that you don't need an alarm clock anymore? You know, sort of bothers you when you have a day off or something like that, but you know, I, I think it's important to be able to get rid of all distractions. So even when we had kids, I know the only way that I could get some time with the Lord would be just to um, get up before they do. <laughs> you know what that's like, don't you? But, um, and I, and, and I, I kind of do almost the same thing. It's contemplative reading. It, it's, and, and I use the Chronological Bible. I love the Chronological Bible. And if you, it's the first time when I used the Chronological Bible that I understood this, the, uh, those little prophets. Malachi and Ezekiel and Habakkuk and yeah. All of those neat little things. And, and when you put it all together, and then now you really start understanding Scripture. It's the first time I've seen, the, seen it in there, unless you're reading it, you're reading kind of a cultural history type of thing. But one of the things that impacted me since Ryan asked us, is there something that impacted you? One day, I, it didn't take me long to think about this. One day I'm reading in Chronicles, and, and I was reading about the fact that David was bringing the Ark of the Covenant back. And they had it on a cart, and they had oxen that was carrying it. And they were kind of trudging through. And all of a sudden, the cart stumbled. And Uzzah, he just innocently reached out to touch it. And guess what happened to him? He died. Now, I read that and I'm like, what kind of God are we serving here? You know? It was like, this is the God I'm serving. But here, folks, understand something. There's so many people that will proof text it, take something out of context, and show you that God isn't what he isn't. You know, what he is, what he isn't, okay? So what was neat in that experience is I read two chapters later. Because at this point, David's like, I don't know what to do anymore, and he sends that cart to a family's house, you know? And then he goes back. And then he finally realizes, okay, we, we made a mistake here, so guess what they did? First mistake is the Levites weren't leading the way. Second mistake is they were, it was on a cart. It wasn't on poles. And that's the way they were supposed to carry it. And so what did David do? He straightened it out. And you know what I learned from that? It's not about God. that makes He's not the one to be afraid of. All he wants is obedience. When you do it the right way, the Ark of the Covenant, 
When you carry it the right way, you won't stumble and nobody will have to touch it. That was such a powerful thing. I didn't even have to think very long but, you know, to do that. And that's years ago that I remember that. And it, it, just, it just grew a greater appreciation of who God is. You know, we, we can be afraid of him, but read every bit of the scripture because something that is confused can be confirmed later on. So read it contemplatively. That's what I tend to do. And it, it's kind of fun. No distractions. Get your phone out of the way. You got, you got to focus on God's word. Okay, I'm glad I had him come up. That's good. So I give you guys some practical tips for time and studying God's word. I won't go through those tonight um, because of, because of time. But I want to share with you one story with me uh, from my reading of scripture one time that really just, I was like, wow. Proverbs 5, 3, verse 3 and 4 says uh, these words about the, the adultery, uh, the traitorous woman in Proverbs 5, and basically how there's like God, Proverbs 2 is like, listen to your father's instruction and you won't be destroyed and you won't fall for the trap of the adulterous woman, which is anyone that's against God or anything, any system against God. And the scripture says in Proverbs 5, 3 and 4, lips drip honey, her speech is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. And I was like, that's interesting. So I went to the, I, I was like, that, that reminds me of a scripture in Hebrews 4, verse 12. And it says this. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. And when I read that, God, like, light, like for you guys, light bulbs went off. That sin is very sharp, and it will cut you, and it will hurt you. But God's word is sharper than any other thing in this world. And that's how important the word of God is. It will cut you in a good way, reveal the sin that has been in your life or my life. And it will cut it out and do surgery on you. So you have one double-edged sword that's sharp, but then... It's awesome how in scripture, the other one says sharper than any double-edged sh sword. So in the end, God still wins. When I read that years ago, I was like, yeah, I need the Bible in my life. <laughs> I want to play this video to help us wrap up tonight in closing. And, uh, and I just, I want you to see this video for an eye opener. This is a Chinese church receiving Bibles. Probably have seen these before. Let's check it out. That's pretty humbling to watch. When I watched that as a youth pastor, that woke me up. That we take for granted what's in here. And right now, the fastest growing church or the most Christians in the world live in China, it seems like right now. The, the explosion of Christianity in China is incredible. I heard of a story of a young boy whose birthday wish was to receive a Bible in China. That was his birthday wish, to receive a Bible in China. That was all he wanted. Of all the things he could ask for, he wanted a Bible. 
and through God's divine providence, someone brought him a Bible. That town was changed forever because now this little boy was reading this Bible and everyone in the town, adults, young people, all came to that town to learn from the word of God. Because in China, if you have a Bible, you are thrown into prison, possibly killed, or you're persecuted forever. And uh, that story is about a, a guy named Brother Yoon, or he's also known as the Heavenly Man. And he started a revival in China that has now affected China in a positive way ever since. And the catalyst was the Bible. And when I see that video, I go, why is there dust on our Bibles in America? You know? Why? What is it that we're missing? You know? And the scripture that came to my mind tonight, and I, I don't know, you know, how you should respond tonight, um, whether it's in your seats or around the altar. I'm going to be completely transparent with you. I think our greatest response is to go home and read the Bible. <laughs> But there is something I do think that there's, some, there's something we can work on tonight in our hearts, and that's idols. Idolatry. Because it's typically idolatry that keeps us from being with God. We put other things above God, so therefore God's time with you suffers. And I'm reading in my personal devotions this past week, and this is the scripture I read. I'm reading through 1 John, and I'm studying paragraph by paragraph and I get to 1 John 5, it's the last verse, verse 21. It doesn't even make sense almost and why it's there. But John writes to the church, he says, Dear children, 1 John 5, 21, Dear children, keep away from anything that might take God's place in your hearts. And another version says, have no other idols in your life. Keep no idols in your life. And I think about that and I go, are there some idols in our lives that have kept us busy and have hurt and hindered our relationship with God even to the point of time? The time that we're not spending with our Lord and Savior and with our God. The quality time that we should have that is not because of duty, but it's because of relationship, you know? And so as we worship tonight, maybe our response is to make him number one in our lives again. To, to get rid of anything, to let God search your heart, to let God work in your heart and show you things that may be preoccupying your heart when only God should occupy your heart. You know, your heart should be just dominated by Jesus. And to have that relationship with him. Or maybe it's just simply you want to go closer to him tonight through these songs and through talking to him. And you want God to speak to you through his word this week. I'm sure he's already been working on your hearts tonight to bring you back to him in a pure relationship with him. Please, please grow, but not out of obligation, but out of love. And please spend time with God because of a relationship and because of the love, not because of a duty. So if you have wrestled with legalism and like doing these things and then you're okay, then, then God loves you. And if you've wrestled with whether God truly does, you need to hear that this week. It keeps coming out, doesn't it? So I'm not sure how you're supposed to respond, but the altars are open. Obviously, you're, you're there in your seats and we can worship him and give him our hearts tonight in preparation for what he wants to say to us in our time with him this week, personally, alone. So God, I thank you for this night. I pray for our church here, Lord, that, that you will see if there are things in the way that are keeping us from growing. And I mean things, idols, or maybe people that we have put before you, God. Maybe it's other habits and routines that are actually hindering our relationship. God, we confess those to you tonight. We ask that you would work in our hearts. God, I pray that we would have a love for you and your word like the church in China, our brothers and sisters there. God, draw us closer to you 
And Lord, let us value your words in our life more than any other words in this world. We worship you now in this moment. We make you number one in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.